All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Area Intelligence 101. I'm Mike Shelby. I'll be your instructor for this course. Start off with some standard caveats. I'm here for the right reason, and that's for emergency preparedness. I'm going to discuss some things that concern me over the future and then describe and teach you about an area study. And that is the very first step towards tackling those challenges, these, these long-term strategic challenges that we face. In this video, we're going to talk about those strategic challenges and give you a picture of why I do an area study and why I think it's urgent for everyone to do their own area study. I just ask that you don't do anything stupid with this training. All right, let's start off with the why. Why we do an area study. There's a big misconception about preparedness. People are concerned about China or about EMP or about a stock market crash or hyperinflation or insert your doomsday apocalypse scenario here. And they really don't understand that they're not actually preparing for those things. They're preparing for the local impacts of those things. They're preparing for the local impacts of a war with China, the local impacts of a stock market crash, societal collapse, in, insert your, your doomsday scenario of choice here. And so that means we really must become experts on the local environment. Okay, that's what we call the tactical level. That is out your front door, down your driveway, down the street of your neighborhood, your broader community, maybe your county or your section of the county. That is the tactical level. There are immediate direct impacts, immediate direct threats, immediate direct effects on you in your tactical environment. So this could range from everything from floods and severe weather like tornadoes or hurricanes to riots to whatever you have going on at the tactical level. This is the first key point here. You live in your your tactical environment. There are many like it, but this one is yours. And so you must prepare for the effects at the tactical local level. Now on the strategic level, the strategic environment, we're dealing with indirect effects, and non-immediate, typically non-immediate things. So we're really talking about things that take weeks or months or most often years to develop, some some things that we can see coming, and things that are going to eventually impact us uh, that are uh, a long ways away. And, and, and we can also add a geographic as, aspect to that and say that the strategic is the national or global level. So things that are happening to the United States may not directly affect you, but they affect your country. They have, And that those things ha- occur on the strategic environment. The first point I, w- I want to talk about here is Sir John Glubb's fate of empires. And his general conclusion was that empires last around 250 years. I think, we, I think some of the dates that he offers, he, he goes through a number of failed or a number of now collapsed empires and we could quibble with him on some of the dates. However, I think as a general rule, a general observation, I do believe it is true that empires last around 250 years or roughly 10 generations. And we can follow the work of other independent researchers like Estonian political scientist Rain Tagapera, who also found that I, I, I did the math. He, He says that, according to his study, empires last around 270 years on average, which is really close to Glubb's 250 years, so I think the general rule is an accurate one. So if we started the American empire in 1776, we're probably going to wind up, you had 250 years, you're going to get around 2026. I was talking to an acquaintance of mine who is a former American history professor, and he said he believed the American empire began in 1783 with the Treaty of Paris, the end of the American Revolution, and that unlocked Trans-Appalachia to American expansion. He believes that is the beginning of the empire. So you start off with 1783, you add 250, you get to 2033, a short decade away. And so I think we're living through it. I think we have already begun this process, and we are... We're, I think we're seeing the effects of an empire in decline, certainly. And according to history, at least uh, nearing collapse at some point. Now, we can debate exactly what that looks like. That's another video. But my point is, we are seeing this play out right now. 
Now, another thing I want to call your attention to is a roughly 600-year study of, of money conducted by J.P. Morgan, and they found that reserve uh, that currencies as the world reserve last around 80 to 100 years, roughly, on average. And that goes all the way back to the Portuguese real, to the, uh, to the pound, which lost its reserve currency somewhere around the uh, middle of the 20th century. And so if we go back and we add 80 years to 1944, that was Bretton Woods, that marked the beginning of the U.S. dollar as the world reserve. You get uh, 1944 plus 80, you get 2024, you add 100, you get 2044. And so I think we are probably also looking at, at least if historic is history is our primary indicator, we are looking at the loss of the U.S. dollar's world reserve status as well. These two things are going to happen simultaneously. The United States cannot fund a global military presence if the dollar loses reserve status. And if the dollar loses, uh, or and, and rather, if the United States uh, empire were to collapse with some kind of catastrophic failure of the government, we would obviously would not have a global military presence either. So we're in a case where one thing is going to trigger the other, or they're, either way, they're both going to have simultaneous effects. They're going to happen simultaneously. And that's what I'm looking at over the next roughly 20 years, give or take. It could be five or 10 years away. It could be five or 10 months away. I don't know. But I think this is this is the strategic environment that I am preparing for. Now, the question is, what are the local effects of this? How does this affect my neighborhood? And that's why I want to do an area study. I can anticipate these big long-term strategic trends. I can look at these things I can feel moderately confident that they will, in fact, happen. And I can say, well, how does this impact my neighborhood, my county, my state, my country, and then beginning, uh, begin to prepare for those specific effects? And again, we do an area study so we can anticipate the local effects of these long-term strategic trends in addition to the, lo- the local tactical effects of uh, local events such as a tornado, a hurricane, a riot, what have you. A couple other things on this point. Ray Dalio wrote a really great book a few years ago called Principles for Dealing with the Changing World Order, and this is the general ebb and flow. This is the cycle of these world orders, and we can probably just use empires simultaneously here. But according to Ray Dalio, you start a new world order, and you go through a period of prosperity, Eventually, you're going to hit a a massive debt bubble. You're going to have a big wealth gap form. This is traditionally due to printing too much money and taking on too much debt. You have a debt bust, and then you get into money printing and credit because you have to pay this debt off, so you have to print the money. Then you get into revolutions and wars, debt and political restructuring, which is just a fancy way of saying a civil war that creates a new government, political restructuring, and After that world order collapses, it is replaced by a new one. And according to Ray Dalio, this is the path that the United States is on. And so it's also important to understand accurately where we are. I think we are definitely past the big wealth gap. And we have not yet had a really bad debt bust. But according to Ray Dalio, if this chart holds, this is coming. So I really think we're on the beginning of the downhill slope of this thing which means we have not gotten to the worst of money printing yet. Everyone wants to freak out about, you know, 30, how many ever trillion, 31, 33 trillion dollars in national debt. Yeah, that's a big deal. It is not a big as a deal as 200 trillion dollars in unfunded liabilities, which the United States is also on the hook for. And of course, they're going to print that money off. They can't save it. They can't clip it from the budgets. They can't possibly tax that amount of money out of the U.S. economy. It just does not exist, and so they are going to print it off. So we haven't yet hit the worst of money printing. Uh, We also have not hit the worst of revolutions and wars. We have not hit political restructuring, and we can all look forward to that in the future. We can also look at, uh, this is another chart from that book, and uh, you know we have definitely reached the top of the world order. We've Number nine there is we've become less productive. Productivity has been dropping for decades. We are overextended globally and domestically. The United States is losing competitiveness. 
technologically, morally, culturally. We already have wealth gaps. We have accrued large debts there at number 13. We have we've been printing money nowhere near as bad as it's going to get. Number 15 there is internal conflict. And number 16 is loss of reserve currency. According to Ray Dello, that is coming next. So we're definitely uh, looking at 14, 15, 16. That's about where we are. And you can see that is midway through the decline. And I bring this up because Ray Dalio is the founder of Bridgewater Associates. For years, that was the world's largest and most successful hedge fund. These folks are making bets using billions of dollars of other people's money. And so they have to be right or else they lose it. And so, you know, I look at someone like Ray Dalio. I don't agree with his politics, but I do agree with his conclusions, which is that this is what is in store for us. And again, I look at this stuff and I say, well, this is why I need to do an area study. We'll talk a lot more about that in subsequent videos. Now, in the backdrop of all this, we have low-intensity conflict, which is raging here in the United States. It is being waged by various social and political groups. Low-intensity conflict is a war beneath the threshold of conventional war, so we're not talking about tanks and bombers. But it is above routine peaceful competition. This is not just political warfare. It is Low-intensity conflict is typically regional. It has strategic uh, impacts. It is uh, essentially tribal warfare. And Low-intensity conflict is an umbrella term that includes everything from violent social movements, which we saw in 2020, to terrorism, which we see in low, at low levels in the United States today. I think it's going to get much worse. It includes insurgency. It includes guerrilla movements, separatist movements. It includes popular revolution, which I think we saw in 2020. I think that was an attempted popular revolution. And I think we are going to see them try to run this again in 2024 plus. Who knows what's going to happen in 2025, but I think things are going to get quite bad again in 2024 because if we do have a recession and we have more stimulus and we have high youth unemployment and we have these various accelerators like an election running in the background, we have essentially the exact same conditions that we had in 2020. And those conditions were accelerants of conflict. And so if those accelerants of conflict exist, all we need is another trigger event to cause a wide-scale unrest and violence like we saw in 2020. I think it's a very good chance that we repeat. And so this is another reason I do my area study. I want to understand the local effects. I live in a different place, or I will live in a different place in 2024 than I did in 2020, which means I'm dealing with different effects because I'm in a different environment. I need to understand that environment so I can anticipate the future. And again, that is why we do an area study. What are the, all the uh, social justice and political and quote-unquote extremist groups that exist in my area, both on the right and the left? I have to document, I, I identify and, and understand them so that I can get a, a better idea of just how bad things are going to get in my neighborhood or my broader community. And once I have that, then I can begin to very specifically prepare for those things. And by prepare, I don't mean pack in my 90-pound bug-out bag. We'll talk a lot more about my perspective of, of true preparedness in upcoming videos. So the big takeaway from all this is that there are big strategic and global events, things that happen at the, the big picture level, and they take years, maybe decades to develop. And those things are going to indirectly affect you. And then we trickle down to regional or operational things. Those have both direct and indirect effects. And then finally, we have the local tactical level, which have direct effects on you. So our mission with an area study is to identify these big picture strategic events and regional or operational level events and determine what the local impact is to your, you and your neighborhood so that you can prepare for the right things. And people who don't do their area study are, I will guarantee you they are missing very critical things and they're going to experience strategic shock when these things kick off because they didn't do their area study. So let's talk about why we need intelligence. Well, we need intelligence because we all have blind spots. 
We all have things that we don't know but need to know. Those things are called intelligence gaps. And one of our jobs in intelligence is to identify those intelligence gaps. If you want to go buy food at a grocery store, your intel gap is where are the grocery stores? Maybe another intel gap is where's the nearest grocery store or which grocery store carries the brand of food that I want to go buy. Those are intelligence gaps and we need to identify those things. We call this the fog of war. And this comes to us by way of an old white guy, Carl von Clausewitz, who said that war is the realm of uncertainty, and I'm just going to use emergencies or conflicts here interchangeably with war. Emergencies or conflicts are the realm of uncertainty. And he goes on to say that roughly 75% of all the factors in a conflict or an emergency is wrapped in a fog of greater or lesser uncertainty. That's where we get the term fog of war. He says a sensitive and discriminating judgment is called for, a skilled intelligence to send out the truth. That is where we get intelligence. So we need information. We have to be able to gather information. We have to be able to produce intelligence in order to reduce our uncertainty. So when I talk about identifying the local far left and far right groups, when I talk about understanding a politician's beliefs, Those people are making the rules under which you will live, presumably. When I talk about understanding local law enforcement, the people who will enforce the rules that the politicians make, all those things go into our area study. And knowing all those things help, uh, it really enables us to anticipate the future. And once we have realistic expectations, we know exactly what to prepare for. And more importantly, I know what, what steps to take if I think my sheriff is going to pursue some type of unconstitutional activity, I can go ahead and start building social power today and maybe act as a check. Maybe not, but it's worth trying. Certainly in my area. It's not a concern of mine. That's why I live here. But understanding you know, what your local law enforcement is going to do may play a pivotal role in where you live or where you decide to live. So during an emergency, we're going to have one of two problems. Either, number one, we're not going to have enough information to drive good decisions. We're not going to have enough information to come in, uh, coming in. Deci- good decisions are based on good information. So we've got to have intelligence collection. And number two, we are going to suffer from information overload. Or, or we're going to suffer from information overload. We're going to have so much information coming in that we are not going to be able to keep up. We're not going to be able to produce enough intelligence in the process. And so the first... The first problem is one of collection, not enough information coming in. The second problem is not enough analysis, not being able to process that information to turn it into intelligence. It takes two to make a thing go right. It takes two to make it out of sight. you got to have collection and analysis. And again, we're taking these big picture strategic events and boiling them down into the local level. And that is, could be... That could be called foresight, which is a solution that only analysis can bring. There's no no individual, no organization on earth other than an intelligence analysis or an intelligence cell that can produce intelligence. And so we have to be able to analyze information in addition to collecting it. Now, why should you listen to me? I'm a former intelligence NCO. I got out as a sergeant, an E5. I was also a contractor, an intelligence contractor. I spent over three years deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. Everything I'm teaching you now is a direct effect of my experience, my doctrinal learning at the schoolhouse in the Army, and then my experience from Iraq and Afghanistan, really looking at and trying to understand how these insurgents are so effective, how are they winning. They're obviously not winning at the tactical level. They were getting absolutely smashed at the tactical level. But they won at the strategic level. And so I started thinking, well, how, what kind of strategic power do these guys have? And we're going to talk about, we're going to talk a lot more about that in the future. As far as uh, what I'm doing today, I run Gray Zone Activity, which is our training company. We teach skills for the Gray Zone. Speci- we could teach pew pew stuff, but we don't. We're teaching skills that I think are necessary to navigate our gray zone future. Again, that's the space between war and peace. 
The United States is not at war with itself, certainly not at peace with itself. So we really focus on intelligence and security, surveillance, reconnaissance, things like that. Intelligence gathering for the gray zone. And then I also run Ford Observer. That is our intelligence production company. So we write a free daily email called the Daily Sit Rep. We cover political, economic, and geostrategic news that you probably missed because most of what we talk about does not get picked up in the news cycle. And I'll provide a link if you want to get on the Daily Sit Rep. We also have some paid reports. Now, we do live in the age of TikTok and short attention spans. So to get people's attention, i got to get a picture of a pretty girl and deliver the message, which is you must become a political agent in your locale. Fundamentally, in preparedness, we're talking about people, and people are social and political creatures Even if you dislike politics, it still matters. You cannot disengage and still expect to win because especially as Americans in a sacred democracy, politics matters. You can't ignore it. So you have to do your area study. Becoming a local political agent also includes organizing your community, building out your network, specifically your intelligence network. Developing political, social, and economic power now so that we don't lose later. And again, winning low-intensity conflict is a matter of who has more political, social, and economic power. This is something that can be won at the local tactical level in your level, but still lost on the strategic level. But you cannot lose at the local level because that is where your direct impacts come from. So we've got to win on the local level. That means having more political, social, and economic power than the other guys. So I hear people say, I don't need an area study. They're wrong. I see people who say an area study is just a bunch of information. They're also wrong. I mean, they're partly right. That's a little bit better answer, but they're still overall wrong. An area study is the basis of all operational planning. So when I say, okay, how do I build political power? Well, I've got to know about local politics. I've got to understand who the movers and shakers are. Is this a place where I am going to be able to gain influence on the political level, or do I need to work through someone else? Can I influence someone who has the political power, and how do I do that? So when I say an area study is the basis for all operational planning, an area study is a blueprint for action, this is what I'm talking about. This guy right here runs local politics. If I want to have any kind of political effect. I need to be able to influence him. Now, how do I do that? That is an operational question. But identifying that guy is a matter of intelligence. And that that and a whole lot more is included in the area study. Now, let's talk about some reasons why we do an area study. Number one, it increases our survivability. Understanding local threats and hazards and future conditions is going to allow me to plan for those things, that is going to increase my survivability. It also allows us to develop realistic expectations of the future. People come and ask me, Mike, Mike, how do I prepare for the future? Well, do your area study. That's going to tell you exactly what you need to be preparing for. It helps us to anticipate future events so that we can prepare for them. And it drives what I call second layer solutions. Now we get into first layer solutions. That's like standard prepping stuff accumulating stuff, food, water, ammo, 90-pound bug-out bags, 90 pounds worth of crap to stuff in your bug-out bags. That's all sustainment. Sustainment gets you through to tomorrow. Sustainment will make sure that you have food in your belly, a can full of water. But that does not win the fight. Having a radio, having a ham radio does not win the fight. Having a 90-pound bug-out bag does not win the fight. What we need is actual operational tools, and I call these things second-layer solutions. We've got to have the first layer. We've got to have sustainment, but we need these layer two solutions, like a neighborhood watch. That's a de facto intelligence network. It also is a building block of building political, social, and economic power locally. You've got to do your area study. It's the basis for all this action. It's the blueprint for what we need to do. We need, I think we need to identify future supply lines. If we get into a war with China, all of a sudden all these this cheap Chinese crap is not available at Walmart anymore. 
how are we going to get the widgets that we need? How am I going to get the the hose clamp? That's maybe a bad example. How am I going to get this? How am I going to get this piece of this uh, part for my truck's engine that I need that's made in China if it's not being shipped to me from China? So we need to start thinking about building parallel economic institutions and parallel production facilities to make up for that gap. I think we need to establish a logistical network at the local level, make sure that I can get the things I need, go ahead and start greasing those wheels today so that we can put them on the, on the tracks tomorrow. Lots of other things are included in Layer 2 Solutions. I'll have to do another video on that at some point. All right, let's talk about the top four reasons why you need to do an area study. This is going to give you a pretty good picture of what you can do with your area study once you have it. And the first reason is we need to identify the full range of local threats, hazards, vulnerabilities, and limitations. Once we identify the threats, we can work on a plan. How are we going to remove threats from our area to increase our safety, increase our survivability? What hazards can we expect in the future? What can we begin preparing for today? Because we know we're going to experience these things in the future. What vulnerabilities do we have? And once we identify our vulnerabilities, we can identify some countermeasures. How are we going to mitigate risk in some of these areas? So how are we going to overcome these limitations? What can we do to remove limitations? Because once we are doing these four things, identifying threats and hazards, vulnerabilities and limitations, we can begin searching for countermeasures, that increases our survivability. And that starts with an area study. The second thing is identify the full range of an area's assets, opportunities, and neutral factors that can be turned into positive factors. So intelligence is not just about the local threat environment. Intelligence is also about opportunities and assets. Maybe I have a neighbor in my neighborhood who is a veteran of the Marine Corps. And he was a scout sniper. Maybe he was an army combat medic. Yeah, I want that guy in my group. I want to be able to go to that guy in my neighborhood and say, hey, let's work on neighborhood security. Let's let's try to formulate some kind of plan just in case the world ends and we need to put that plan into action. We're going to have a lot of veterans out there who are turned on to this kind of stuff. And you're going to be, we're going to be able to work with them, but we have to identify these assets first. By neutral factors that can be turned into positive factors. I'm specifically talking about, uh, let's take groups of people, for instance. Let's say there's a church community in my neighborhood, and I know that there are people who are concerned about the future. They are, at this point, neutral factors. They don't have any real impact on me, but they could have a positive impact on local security. They could have a positive impact impact on our uh, operating operational environment. And so I'm going to go to this church. I'm going to meet with the pastors, and maybe I'm going to say, hey, let me put on a, a free 60-minute presentation on emergency preparedness. I'll do it on a Sunday night, Wednesday night, whenever. And, you know, uh, there, there's a lot that could go into this. But, you know, my ultimate goal is to use this as a network builder to reach out and inform people, begin to influence people. And if I can turn some members of that congregation into a more preparedness and security-minded outlook, then I'm going to be building strategic advantages for my neighborhood. I'm going to be turning these neutral factors into positive factors, and that's something that nearly everyone can be doing at the local level. And again, we use the area study to identify these assets and opportunities, and then we act because an area study is a blueprint for action. Now, number three, an area study is mission critical for a wide array of things. In the Army, we said intelligence drives the fight, and that means that we need to produce intelligence. So for us, an area study is mission critical for a lot of people because if you plan to provide area security, we have to understand the area. We have to understand lines of drift and the physical terrain features. How are threats going to get from outside my neighborhood to inside my neighborhood? Let's maybe work on putting sensors out there or otherwise securing the neighborhood in that type of environment. If you are responding to a disaster, providing any kind of relief or humanitarian aid, or maybe you're 
doing search and rescue, we have to know the area. And so an area study helps us in that way. If you are going to a foreign country or maybe even in a domestic scenario where you have to escape and evade unlawful restraint, then it's a really good idea to understand the area where you're going to be in. What areas can provide you safe haven? That goes into your area study. And we can go down these rabbit holes later, but my point is an area study is an incredible planning tool. It is the basis for all operational security and preparedness planning. If you don't have an area study, it's going to be very difficult to run those operations without having done the work. Remember, planning is cheap. Action is expensive. The more work we do on the planning side, the smoother and less expensive our actions become. And that planning is all based on the area study, which is why we do one. And finally, an area study can help you expand your tribe, increase access to information, and build local political, social, and economic power. This is a point I'm going to continue driving home in the following videos because this is what it takes to win. If you do not have local, political, social, and economic power at the local level, you're going to lose and you're going to experience someone else's political, social, and economic power. And maybe in a lot of areas, the best you can do is compete. And if that's the best you can do, that's better than not competing, unless you're okay with living under someone else's political, social, and economic power, which may not be in your best interest. So this is why we need to do an area study. In the following videos, we're going to do a deep dive into what goes into an area study. Today, we just talked about why you need an area study, but hopefully you understand the context. Hopefully you understand what an area study is and more importantly, what it allows you to do once you've done an area study. I'll be back in future videos and we're going to go way deep down this rabbit hole. So everyone, thanks for watching and until next time, be well and stay out front.